Well, hello folks. Uh, good evening. Uh, yeah, this is a little different startup, but um, this is uh, Nick Barris. He's the uh, reporter from Nashville, and um, he's uh, reporting on the um, Raleigh Strain uh, case, and he's also talking about the uh, Sebastian Rogers, um, the uh, that uh, situation with the missing, uh, with him missing. And, um, it's interesting what Nick is saying here. Um, so you guys, if you will, um, let me know what you think after watching this. So let me get this started here and here we go. Good evening, everyone. This is, uh, Nick Barris with News Channel 5, the CBS affiliate in Nashville, Tennessee, coming to you Facebook Live on a Tuesday evening, um, another Facebook Live updating you on uh, the latest in the investigations and developments in two high-profile missing persons cases that we've been following over the past several weeks. I promised you that I would do updates um, when new ones came along. A lot of you have messaged me. There's been quite a bit over the last few days, and so um, I think it's time to do that. I'm going to kind of go over both of them one at a time, and then I'll go back through and scroll through your questions for either one of them, if you want to join in the conversation on that. And... Uh, is 8 o'clock Central Time, wherever you may be watching, and I know so many people still following this. So, um, we know about the two cases. Um, Riley Strain, the 22-year-old Missouri student um, who disappeared here in the Nashville area, um, and Sebastian Rogers. Both were missing persons cases. There's only one missing persons cases remaining, and we're going to start first with the latest I can tell you about Riley Strain. As, as you know, tragically, um, his body was recovered from the Cumberland River, just downriver, about six to eight miles from downtown Nashville, where he was last seen. His body was recovered on Friday, and um, just horribly tragic. Um, the hope was that he might be found alive. He had been missing for just about two weeks. Um, my heart goes out to his family. They seemed like wonderful people and were very gracious throughout, even spoke afterwards, and I don't know how anyone could once his body was found. <clears throat> In the time since then, the 911 call had been released of how his body was found. I can go over that um, and then tell you a little bit about why that investigation is not closed yet with regard to Riley Strain. Again, his body was pulled from the Cumberland River. That was on Friday. <clears throat> it was a barge worker that um, was uh, out that morning and spotted um, the body floating face down at the end of a barge beneath a log. He had to roll over the log and recognized it. And almost immediately, according to the 911 call, recognized uh, the, uh, the body to be that of Riley Strains, called it in. Um, authorities immediately arrived on the scene. The family was notified and removed him uh, from the uh, water. Um, at that point, um, Metro Police Chief John Drake was down there as well. And uh, there was a preliminary autopsy, an examination by the medical examiner who was called to the scene. And uh, at that point, Chief Drake said that um, it appears as though there's no obvious signs of trauma to his body and that um, it's, in his opinion, at that early stage, still looked as though no foul play was involved. And this may have just been a horrible, horrible accident. Now, the reason the case is not closed, the body was then sent for a full autopsy, which uh, my understanding was conducted this past weekend. Um, I'm friends with and spoke with Metro's chief medical examiner, Dr. Feng Ling, and he, Dr. Feng Li, um, did not perform the autopsy himself. It was his staff that did so. <clears throat> and he said uh, that they would uh, be going through the process of, of examining the body closely. Our understanding is based on further preliminary autopsy examination is again, no over, overt signs of trauma, meaning there, there's no sign that he was shot, certainly no sign that he was stabbed, no sign of, say, a blow to the back of the head that might have sent him into the water, nothing like that. Um, so they still say it appears as though no trauma possible, no foul play. The reason the case isn't closed is they've um, taken blood samples and they've been sent off for toxicology, which can take two, three, four, five weeks to get those results back. They'll be checking for blood alcohol level in Riley strain and along with whether or not there was any other indication of um, foreign substances in his blood, possibly some kind of drugs. A lot of people wondered, is it possible he received a roofie or was drugged in one of his drinks at the bars? 
I checked with Metro police detectives asking him about that. I had learned that that very same evening, um, another individual, not with Riley Strain, but hitting the bars downtown, had been drugged and was robbed of $30,000 downtown. Um, um, he woke up unconscious, doesn't remember anything. Somehow they got hold of his bank account, cleaned out his bank account, and that's the sign of being roofied. We've heard of cases like that happening in downtown Nashville. So I was thinking, is it possible someone gave Riley a drug and that was part of what contributed to his condition? Because a lot of the uh, security video that was made available to us showed him clearly staggering under the influence of something as he walked along the streets of Nashville, making his way down toward the Cumberland River where he was last seen. So um, some people say the live is freezing up. If that is, it may be on yours because mine, I'm following it here, seems to be operating properly. So anyway, um, they're going to be testing for the presence of other types of drugs in his system. Again, I did talk to Metro police and detectives asking him if they thought he might have been drugged. I was told that they had a rundown of the various bars Riley and his fraternity brothers had gone to that night. They pulled video from all of those locations and tried to monitor it. And at no time did they see any evidence of someone possibly tainting one of his drinks. Now, is it possible they could have missed that? Absolutely. In these very crowded bars on a Friday night. But they say there's no indication to them that he had been drugged based on the videos that they had seen. So what we know then is the tests will be done. We'll see if he had other substances in his body. Um, one thing that a lot of people are waiting for, and this was not made public, and I asked Dr. Lee about this. Um, people are wondering, all right, well, when we do the autopsy, uh, can we check for evidence of water in his lungs? The thinking is, if he was alive when he fell into the river, he would have inhaled water into his lungs, and that would have been a sure sign indication of drowning. Whereas sometimes people are recovered from rivers and you think, oh, they died from drowning and you realize there's no water in their lungs, which means they couldn't have been breathing underwater there, which means maybe they were dead before they ended up in the water, which could be an indication of foul play. And he said, while sometimes that's true, that is not a clear cut indicator. In fact, he says that's not all that definitive, whether there's water or not. And, and I asked him, I got, so what do you mean by this? And the medical examiner told me that, um, that when a person struggles to breathe underwater, they can, in about 20% of the cases, experience a reflex called a laryngeal spasm right here, all right? And this spasm, while you're underwater, I think a reflex to keep water from going into your lungs literally shuts your throat down at that moment. When that happens, it means you can no longer breathe, okay? So that means no water goes into the lungs, and technically that's known as dry drowning. So... We have not heard whether or not they found water in his lungs or not, but if they didn't, it does not necessarily mean that he was dead before he fell into the water. Based on everything I've seen to this point, what law enforcement has told me, um, barring some significant new development, my thought is that what happened to Riley Strain was just an absolutely horrible accident with no one to blame. And I know so many of us are looking for we want to blame someone here or blame someone there. In my opinion, you can't blame the bar. The bar um, that he was thrown out of for whatever type of behavior it was that was inappropriate um, provided records showing that they served Riley, based on their records, one alcoholic drink and two waters. Now, does that mean his friends weren't giving him drinks or someone else was buying? We don't know, but I don't blame the bar for this. It is a 22-year-old legally drinking, and more than half the people in downtown Nashville on any Friday or Saturday night are drunk. It's the truth, okay? Um, so I don't blame that. I don't blame his fraternity brothers. They were there drinking him with him. Um, for all we know, when he was thrown out, one of them followed him down. He said, look, guys, yeah, I'm just going to walk and clear my head. You go back up there and have a good evening. We don't know what he told the fraternity brothers, but I can tell you his mother, um, who I have an awful lot of respect for, this woman has grace and my heart breaks for Riley's mother, but she made it clear that she loves the fraternity brothers. She does not blame them and they're hurting every bit as much, she says, as she is over the loss of a very good friend. There was some idiot on here last time I went Facebook Live wanting to blame the, the parents of Riley's reign saying, well, I, I raised my kid not to drink that much. I don't even want to go there. That's ridiculous. It's stupid. And if you're out there still, please don't post because that's absurd. Um, so beyond that, that's what we know about the case. We should have the full autopsy results coming um, in the next uh, 
few weeks. And when it does, I'll make sure to let you know what comes back on that. But again, to me, the case, yes, remains open. But my belief is this was a confluence of circumstances. And you're going to say, okay, Nick, try to explain this to me. And let me give you my scenario based on what I've learned talking to investigators. He gets thrown out of the bar, okay? He's probably had a lot to drink. I'm guessing these fraternity members, because the cost of drinks are so expensive in these bars, maybe drank before they even left the hotel or wherever they were staying, okay? They're drinking because they would drink ahead of time so they can just order run drink and not have to pay as much. So he's drinking more. Whether he's drugged or not, I don't, I don't believe he was, but if he drank too much, he gets thrown out, and we see the video of him walking and staggering. Um, and you see, unfortunately, a lot of that sometimes. And there are people like that in downtown Nashville on a Friday night that have too much to drink. And oftentimes they get arrested and thrown in the drunk tank. Usually if they get in a fight or start, you know, breaking or vandalizing. Riley was just walking and staggering along his way. Somehow he made his way down to Gay Street, which is along the edge of the Cumberland River. There's a point there where there's a walk wall where he could easily have fallen over. Um, he could have decided to walk down into the ravine um, for whatever reason, maybe to relieve himself, who knows, and stumbled and fallen into the water. Can we rule out the possibility? Everyone's wondering where was his wallet? I don't know where his wallet was. They did find his bank card. Is it possible that someone grabbed his wallet and shoved him into the water? Okay, I can't rule that out, but my thinking is somehow he made his way down there. He was in such a condition that he then toppled into the water, I'm not exactly sure how, and sadly drowned. And I don't blame Riley either. He's a 22-year-old on spring break with friends, having a bit to drink, walks out in an unfamiliar city, makes his way toward the river, loses his balance, and perhaps falls in. I know there's going to be those of you who have conspiracies or other questions along these lines. That's fine. Fair enough. We can talk about that. But that is my thought, and that is what I've heard from law enforcement. And barring some unusual discovery that we haven't heard about from the autopsy, I think the case will be closed as a horrible, heartbreaking accident. Okay, shifting to the other remaining open um, missing persons case, and that is Sebastian Rogers, the 15-year-old um, young man who um, has autism, who disappeared from his home in Hendersonville, Hendersonville Tennessee. And again, people are saying this image is freezing up. It's not. I'm seeing myself talking here. So it's wherever you may be. But um, in Hendersonville, Tennessee, one month ago today, he's been gone four weeks and has disappeared without a trace. Um, in terms of new developments, I can tell you over the past several um, days, past several weeks, there's been little from official law enforcement because they're busy working the case. And what frustrates me sometimes on social media is that people are like, well, you know, the Cajun Navy has come. They were here to help with Riley and they're helping look. Another pair of eyes looking, fine. Cajun Navy, fine, whatever. Another pair of eyes, a lot of volunteers, people on Facebook coming out and looking, assisting the father, um, Seth Rogers, out there looking. I think some people are now turning to psychics for tips on maybe where to look because there's no other leads to follow. That's fair enough, whatever. Um, uh, but a lot of people may be saying, well, I'm glad these other groups are coming in because we don't think law enforcement is doing enough to look. And if that's what you're thinking, let me just tell you right now, you are wrong, unequivocally wrong. From the beginning of the first call made by Riley's mother that he was missing, or excuse me, Sebastian's mother, from the very beginning when she went to wake him up to go to school and he was gone, to when law enforcement, Sumner County Sheriff, um, Sumner County EMA responded, they have done things by the book, okay? They have set up the search. They've looked for the first eight days, a very active search with more than 1,400 people, dogs from the air, just very, very complete and comprehensive searches. And not a single trace of Sebastian has been found. Now, people were bringing this up again, like there's not enough going on. So if you get a chance, if you haven't seen it yet, I met with Ken Widener. He is director of Sumner County EMA, Mickey Summers, good people, the two of them heading up the search effort, okay? They're not the criminal investigation, that's the sheriff's department, or rather investigation, we'll call it, um, but rather just the search. And um, the two of them invited me, and I'm the first and only reporter to be brought into the uh, emergency operations center where they have the huge map up and going over everything that they've been doing over the past four weeks. And I felt it was important to put that out there for people to see that, 
you know, law enforcement is going to call a news conference every day just to tell you there's nothing new. OK, they're continuing to track down leads. I was absolutely stunned and amazed by the scope of the search. When you see my story, which I will link to my page when I get done with this Facebook Live, they take me in there and they go over everything that they have done and what they continue to do. Now, after the first eight days, they dialed back the search effort. They had gone within a radius. They had searched with dogs. They had been out there. They'd covered their ground. They met with neighbors and all of that. Now they're in a stage where they continue to respond to tips that come in either to the TBI or to um, the local sheriff's department or the public calling them in, and they respond to them. And my story tonight, um, which I hope you get a chance to look at, kind of shows how, you know, I asked them all kinds of questions. A lot of you are asking, for instance, did they ever go into the, the family's house and search it? Oh, yeah. They've been into the family's house and searched it more than 10 times with dogs, okay? Did they search um, the flood drains and the sewer system? I have video of where they've gone in there and searched every one of the drainage pipes that are in this neighborhood underneath it. They've been in there. They've searched it. Have they searched caves? Yes, they've had spelunkers in. The map shows where all the caves are, and they've been all those places. They've had calls in. Bones found over here. And they go and investigate the bones. Turns out to be deer bones. And we should say this. Um, there have been a few cases where searchers come across bones and they call it in and make a big hullabaloo about, oh, we better check this out. <clears throat> At this point in the game, if Sebastian is dead and he's somewhere out there, he is not skeletonized yet. He is not skeleton. He, it's, he hasn't been out there long enough that all that would be left is skeleton, okay? So if bones are found, um, it's at this stage of the game, it's not Sebastian. It's just not. But they still are out trying to reconnect there, okay? Um, so what I can tell you is that law enforcement, and I hope to learn more from that side of it, from the Sumner County Sheriff's Office, but EMA and all of them, very, very involved. They're busy working a case like their their responsibility to come to the public and constantly comment. And, and they say, look, they're frustrated with a lot of the armchair detectives out there and the conspiracy theories and the blaming. And what I want to go back to again here is with regard to the parents, the stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, okay, the biological mother, Katie, neither one of them are considered suspects. There's no indication at this point of foul play. And they've been cooperative throughout. So has Seth Rogers, his biological father. And it's not fair to go after them. A lot of people are making a big fuss over the fact that it looks like Chris and Katie have left the home there and took off in his camper. And they're like, well, did he ex you know, just take off? Where's he going? Well, he works. He lives in the camper when he goes to locations to do his uh, construction work or whatever it is back in the Memphis area. And yeah, as much as they want to continue searching, they know law enforcement is doing this and he has to work. So that's where they've gone. They've gotten into the camper. And I listen, a lot of people have um, asked me, I have not had a chance to interview them and that's fine. They've done plenty of other interviews and I had most recently a chance to listen to their interview um, with Nancy Grace. Did, a lot of you have asked me, what do I think of that? What do I think of the Nancy Grace interview? And I think I heard a lot of the same things that I've heard in other interviews, nothing particularly new. But I will say this about Nancy Grace and uh, the stepfather and biological mother sitting there and answering the questions. She went after them. She covered a lot of ground. OK, um, she asked them pointed questions. And to their credit, they answered them all. Um, and so where I sit again you all may have some suspicions and you're frustrated that he hasn't been found, but there is no evidence whatsoever, okay, that the parents had anything to do with his disappearance. Now, hey, that could change if something new develops, but my belief, and especially after listening to the Nancy Grace interview and the way they answered, and she asked a lot of pointed questions for over an hour. I thought her interview was the best of all of them I've heard of any of the, the podcasts, and I think they've done a couple local media interviews. That was the best. It covered it all, and they stuck with it and answered all of her questions. Um, and, you know, among other things, you know, the and I haven't heard this confirmed from law enforcement, but uh, Katie, the biological mother, said she took and passed a lie detector test. Now, I, I know there was an earlier report I heard that Chris said that he had taken a lie detector test and passed it. But now on Nancy Grace's, he said he hadn't taken it yet, but he's willing to. She said if she sets one up, would he do it? And he said absolutely. So, again... Whether you pass a lie detector test can be an indicator, but there's a reason those are not admissible in court. 
lie detectors are unreliable by definition. And so, yeah, that's something. But um, I just wanted to hit on that. After listening to that interview with them and the way they sat there and answered many of Nancy Grace's, you know, pointed questions over and over again, I give them credit. They answered them. And you may have your suspicions and we may all want to think, well, that's most likely. I've just got to say no at this point. Please don't threaten the step parents, stepfather or, or mother or biological father. There is zero evidence linking them. And trust me, if the TBI or the sheriff's department thought they had something, they'd take it right now to the district attorney. They would get an indictment and they would arrest them on the spot. And you know what? It doesn't take a whole lot. If they had circumstantial evidence, they could say, let's just go ahead and take a stab at it and see if they break under questioning. If they had anything. They would do that. You don't think they're feeling pressure to solve this case? So let's just put that to rest. It, it, you know, in the absence of any new evidence that surfaces, uh, I think we need to just stop, you know, trying to point the finger at individuals where there's no evidence. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about that, but it's not fair to go after them, in my opinion. Um, so where does it go from here? It was, like I said, very interesting. I had access. You need to see the story because the huge map in their control nerve center that documents everything they've done and that they continue to do. They were just out this past Thursday based on what they thought was a credible tip. Okay, um, Ken Widener, who I have an awful lot of uh, respect for, says, listen, I appreciate all these other volunteers and, you know, the, uh, the Cajun Navy and others that maybe are looking, that's fine. And he knows that a lot of them are searching based on maybe um, psychic tips or whatever. I don't know how you feel about psychics. I, you know, I... I'm just going to tell you, I have never covered any case in my career where a psychic has solved it. Now, do they do some research and offer opinions and it's worth looking? Hey, if you want to look anywhere, that's great. But Ken made it clear. He didn't want to speak poorly of psychics, whatever. If you want to go that route in the absence of everything else, that's fine. But he said they have to deal with credible tips. And they wait until they hear either from the sheriff's department or the TBI on something they need to check out. And they go. And, and they've been going on a regular basis. And if you look at just the sheer volume of places they've been and what they've looked at, um, yeah, don't for a second think that they're not continuing to work this case. But after a month, they won't answer these questions. But I can tell you after a month and finding no trace of Sebastian, you have to assume somehow, some way, either he's gotten caught or fell into some kind of tight spot that he could never get out of, in which case by now he is dead, or he was abducted or taken by someone. And again, as we've said, there's no social media for him. Um, he did not have a cell phone that was checked that had anything in it. So um, where is he? And the frustration by Ken and Mickey and others with EMA is there. They're, they're used to getting results. And when they do things by the book, they're used to finding the people they're looking for, whether it's dead or alive, and they cannot explain where he is. It's a quandary. And as I've said all along, let's go back to this. Children do not disappear, just vanish without a trace on their own. Could Sebastian have found a way to disappear on his own? It's not outside the realm of possibility, but it's highly unlikely. Um, so, could someone else have been involved? That's it. I wish I had more to tell you about the case um, with Sebastian Rogers. Um, you know, I think from the very beginning with regard to Riley Strain, a lot of conspiracy, where is he? Someone grabbed him. From the very beginning, I think we all knew the most likely scenario was somehow, some way, he had fallen into the river. And that's exactly what happened. With Sebastian, you know, we talked about dogs. I talked about that with Ken today. And, and, you know, it's been back and forth about, well, the dogs initially traced ascent, excuse me, traced ascent all the way down to a, a pond, which they then drained and, and as such. And really, the dogs never hit on anything that they considered to be a hard and fast Sebastian trail. And hitting on that pond, they went with divers and then they drained it. There was nothing there. So that was a red herring. The dog was on something else. The dogs. And again, Ken made a point. Bloodhounds and cadaver dogs are valuable tools, but they, they're they not foolproof. They miss scents. They're not able to hit on that. Um, it is, for a lot of people, hard to believe that if he did go walking down this area, that the dogs didn't hit on something solid that night. 
Again, many of you have seen um, the video that I posted of um, what appeared to be two lights outside of Sebastian's home. The parents say that they don't believe that's flashlights or anyone out there. And the TBI and other investigators say they've collected home video of all kinds of, you know, possible lights. And they say there's nothing of evidentiary value. And I will take them at the, on their word on that. I would like someone to explain to me what those lights in my story are. Maybe it's a reflection off something. Maybe they, you know, explained it as, you know, someone out walking their dog or chasing a cat and, and that's how they explained it. But I would like to know because the video I posted, and if you go back on there are ways on my page or look at newschannel5.com, appears to show what looks like maybe lights moving outside in the area around Sebastian's home the night he disappeared. But I'm just going to say at this point, um, from the parents to the TBI and others, they say they've reviewed it. They say, at least right now, it's not of any evidentiary value. Fair enough. I wish they'd tell us what they thought those lights were, and they never have. A lot of people have asked about why has um, law enforcement not released the 911 call made in the Sebastian Rogers case? I mean, we heard the 911 call from Riley Strain. And the reason for that is there wasn't a 911 call. The way I understand it is um, the stepfather is the one who made the call. And he made the call from when he was in Memphis. Dialing 911 from Memphis doesn't work anyway, okay? Because um, that would take you to the Memphis 911. So, you know, um, depending on where he's calling from, I guess. But what he said is, yeah, because, um, and this was in the Nancy Grace piece, that he called directly to the sheriff's department. So my understanding, if that's true, there's no recording. He called directly to avoid transfers and the such that would have taken time. He called straight to the sheriff's department and they responded within 10 minutes. And as I said, I think law enforcement from top to down and bottom has um, um, done an excellent, excellent job. So what bothers me about this is they've done such an excellent job and we're at a loss to explain what happened to Sebastian Rogers. I don't know at what point a case technically goes cold. It's not there yet and no one is giving up. But after four weeks, um, unless he was abducted, the belief has to believe is that he's no longer alive. But where is he? Where's the body if that's the case? And if he is alive, who took him? And where and why? No answers for you on that. So feel free to speculate. There's speculation and rumors out there. But what I do want to put to rest, at least with the story tonight, those of you who say, thank goodness for all these other groups out there looking because EMA and others, the professionals are no longer doing it. That's just a simply false pretense. They continue to be very involved, and I saw it firsthand today. All right. So oh, going to, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. I'll leave the link uh, if you want to watch this again. Um, Nick Barris, he does a good job. But there's one thing that I did take away from this, and I it's just at the very end there that again speculation this is just my thought and i'm wondering about this he just said about the phone call about the 911 call um why did um why did uh, chris not call 911 but he called a direct number to the sheriff's department um, I guess in uh, Hendersonville, Tennessee. Um, would that uh, have been if he called not, you see, when he called 911, you are recorded. If you call the direct number to, you know, like dispatch um, um, or the office, you're not recorded. At least that's what I've been told. Don't know if that's true or not. But it is in interesting why he didn't call 911. I can understand if he was in Memphis and he didn't call 911, um, he would have, um, of course, he would have um, been routed to Memphis. But, <laughs> um, if he had a call 911 and he was in the area, not Memphis, then it would have picked up, you know, what area that he was in. So 
I'm just speculating. I'm just, we want answers. Now, do I agree with what uh, Nick, the reporter, is saying here um, about speculation and all? No, I mean, we have, we have a right to speculate. And a lot of times, you know, the public outside of the realm of what other people can see, we can sometimes put sometimes put the, the pieces of the puzzle together that could be very beneficiary, I guess. I don't know. But folks, uh, let me know what you think about this interview. I'd be curious to hear your uh, thoughts uh, about Raleigh Strain and Sebastian Rogers. Um, I'll uh, try to put together another video tomorrow if I hear any news, uh, especially on Sebastian Rogers. And um, I hope all of you have a good evening. I'll tell you, it's been, uh, it's been a crazy day the day I, I know. And we go here. I always try to put up the poster here. Uh, and this is uh, Brian DeVoe. Uh, age 17, um, and he is from Memphis, Tennessee, missing since August 25th, 2023. If he looks familiar to you, please call 1-800-TBI-FINE. So, all right, folks. Well, hope you have a good evening. Um, be sure to, if you will, hug somebody in the family. Tell them you love them because you just never know. Okay, folks, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your likes and um, and the su subscribers. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I hope all of you have a very good evening. And until next time, folks, this is George. And, well, we'll see you down the road. Bye-bye.